Hello guys and welcome to another video. So it is currently October and I have already read over 50 books. My 2022 reading challenge was to read about 40 books, so you can say I'm a bit ahead of schedule. And since I've read so much, I wish I had done this earlier, but I'm starting to do monthly reading wrap-ups. So the first thing I read in October was on my Kobo and that was Winter's Orbit. Now I had never heard about Winter's Orbit before but my friend McKenna recommended it so of course I wanted to pick it up. It's set in space in a galaxy far far away and one of the points of views is the prince of a planet that governs all of the other planets in that solar system and basically that prince was a known rebel, a partier, but he was now reformed and he was doing much better. And then the other perspective follows his future husband and we get to know right from the get-go from the first couple of pages that they are meant to be married and they get married super fast, but the conflict is that this guy that he gets married to was married to the prince's cousin before until, you know, the prince's cousin died in an accident. So it follows them two and them getting to know each other, getting to know each other's past and figuring out a bit how they work, getting to know more about the, the cousin. Yeah, the cousin was a character, let me tell ya. And this book just wasn't for me. It's just one of those books where you're like, objectively, it's a good book, you know, it's pretty average. There's nothing extremely wrong with it, but it just didn't click with me. I liked the main leads just fine, but every other single character felt very one-dimensional. The romance wasn't clicking too much with me. The first half, nothing happened. And then it suffered a bit from showing and not telling. Since I didn't like it too much, I'm just gonna say it wasn't for me. Next up, I read Yes, No, Maybe So, and I basically picked this up because it was co-written by the author of Simon vs. the Homo Sapiens Agenda, which I really liked when I first read. And this story follows two points of views. First, we have Jamie, a Jewish kid whose family is very connected to politics. And then we have Maya, a South Asian girl who is also Muslim, whose parents are going through through a soft divorce or at least a separation. They were childhood friends but they hadn't seen each other in 10 years and then they meet again and they start canvassing together for one of the candidates in one of the upcoming state elections. I should have known that this book was going to be a lot about US politics. I just usually prefer to not know what a YA contemporary is about because I feel like it gives too much of the plot away. So I was taken aback when three fourths of this book was US politics. Honestly, it wasn't as bad as you might think. The two authors found a way to really sell it and to make it interesting and to really make you care. There were really important topics discussed in this book, so I also enjoy seeing those topics have some light shed on them. The first few chapters kind of lost me, but I kept going and then I really started to enjoy the book. I wish that the main relationship between Maya and Jamie had been kept platonic. I just wish that Maya hadn't had her feelings turned from platonic to romantic. I think they would have worked better as platonic besties and we rarely see that in YA contemporary. So I think that would have been like a really cool twist for them to just remain friends. And I think that would have made more sense with Maya's character and her family background. Next up, I read volume five of Fence, and I currently don't have it because I just lent it to my friend to read it. Fun fact, she had these four volumes in her house for over a year because I lent them to her. She was like, I'll read them. And then a year later, uh, she finally gave them back. Thank you, Erica. I was waiting, but you delivered after a year. In case you don't know, the Fence comics follow Nicholas, who is a huge fencing fan, but he doesn't have a lot of money and fencing is kind of for rich people so he tries to train on his own and then he gets accepted into this really cool very rich school that gives him a scholarship for fencing and the story goes from there and he meets his rival who obviously is a fencing prodigy if you know sports anime you know what kind of shenanigans ensue this was cancelled after four volumes and it recently got picked up again and we got volume 5, and at the end of volume 5, it has the three words, to be 
continued and I can't wait for volume 6 because volume 5 was just perfection and well at 5 out of 5 stars I loved it and I would recommend this for everyone. I don't think everyone will like it but I just want everyone to read it so they keep making more. And then once again on my Kobo I read Jay's Gay Agenda. And this book was a roller coaster of emotions. If you like watching reality TV because of the messiness and the drama, then this is probably the book for you. It has nothing to do with reality TV, but oh my god, is that boy messy. So this book follows Jay, our main character, and his gay agenda. Jay basically has spent all of his life living in a town and going to school where he is the only out gay kid. And so he feels like he hasn't gotten to experience those teenage milestones, relationship milestones, like all of his other colleagues. So when his mom gets presented a job offer that makes them move, he is super excited to finally meet other gay kids and, you know, check off items of his gay agenda with them. So he goes to this other school, he quickly becomes friends with Max, tells him about the gay agenda, and he becomes his gay guide in order to help him check off those things of his list which leads him to have two guys. One, Albert, who he actually likes and who he wants to check off those emotional items off the list, and then Tony, who he is very attracted to and who he can check off those more physical and, dare I say, horny items of the list. And obviously I was always rooting for Albert, even though Albert is the first guy he meets when he goes to school. And on top of all this boy drama and him kind of two-timing two guys, there's this drama with his best friend back at home, Lou, who doesn't have a lot of money and who is having a lot of financial and relationship trouble. And then of course he tells Albert that he's going to homecoming with me, but he also tells his best friend Lou back at home that he is going to, to the hoe down back at home with her. And oh my god, wouldn't you know it, they happen to be on the same exact day. Of course. Because of course. I guess he is a 17 year old, but I do not condone his actions and how he behaved. And I still think that Max is still a bit of a villain and did not deserve such a heartfelt apology from Jay. Because Max, I always, I knew something was up with him. And I don't know, I just don't trust him. But all in all, I enjoyed it very, very messy. The start of that third act was like watching a train wreck. Next, I read Blanc by Asumiko Nakamura, and these follow the characters from In the Same Class. I believe that's what the manga is called, and it's the latest installment. And this was recommended to me by my friend Sara, who absolutely adores this series. It's her favorite thing in the world, and I've already read the rest of the manga, so it wasn't new to me, and I really enjoyed it. I have to say, though, the first volume was heartbreaking like you start reading it and you're like this is the most beautiful thing ever they're so in love and then after chapter one everything just like slowly goes downhill and just crashes and burns but then the second volume oh it, it still hits you with that heartbreak yeah it keeps that angst going but then in the end I don't want to spoil it, but in the end. I really enjoyed that one. That was very heartwarming and equally as heartbreaking. So there's a bit of everything in there. And if you've read the main series, I recommend that you keep reading. Next up, I read Call Down the Hog by Maggie Steve Otter. This is the sequel trilogy to the series The Raven Boys. I would say that this book could do without half of the point of views that it has. I obviously get Ronan, okay, great point of view, probably my favorite. Declan, I can also understand, I get it, maybe a little bit redundant since at least in this book, he adds nothing to the story. Hennessy and Jordan are POVs that I really enjoy, so I would say that they're important to the book and that they add to the plot and to the spice and to the lore. But Farrakh Lane and that Lillian lady, you know, the visionary who just explodes from time to time, they don't have to have POVs. I also have a feeling that Maggie Steve Otter is very much in love with her own writing. Like there is no plot, there is just writing and characters. I know not to expect plot for Maggie Steve Otter, but at least, you know, important characters or things that I care about. Rona doesn't even mention Noah or Henry ever existing. I just wish they were more present since they were so important 
in his life just a year ago. I wish we got more mentions to them. And I did not remember 75% of that plot. Plot. Next up, I read Pumpkin Hats, the graphic novel by Rainbow Rowell. And yes, I am currently cosplaying the workers at this pumpkin patch. I am very dedicated to my craft. It's very entertaining. It has all of the fall autumn vibes that you want. If you like pumpkins and pumpkin patches, then I would highly recommend. This is very escapist for someone who hasn't ever gone to an American pumpkin patch. So it's very cool to see and I just... Every time I read this, I get so hungry because everything in it looks delicious. There's so many dishes that I would like to try from this. But it's four out of five stars and the couple in it is very cute. And so am I in this outfit. But let's keep going with my dreamer marathon. Next up, I dreamt... <laughs> what? Next up, I read Mr. Impossible by Maggie Stiefvater. I have a whole ass reading vlog about reading this book when it came out. I read the book, I filmed, and I edited that video, and I probably watched the video after editing it, and I can promise you, I barely remembered 20% of what happened in this very book. Spoilers, when I tell you that I suspected Bride of being someone's dream and maybe being Ronan's dream and when I got to it I fully gasped and I was like, wait, <laughs> I'd already read this. How am I still surprised by the biggest plot twist? Those are the things that you're supposed to remember, but clearly I had forgotten everything about it. I knew to be suspicious. I still really enjoyed Hennessy. She's such an interesting, complex character and Jordan as well. It's very nice to see how they're very, very similar, but still very, very different. Declan, I like him when he's talking about Jordan or his siblings. It's a very interesting sibling dynamic that he has. Ronan, of course, loved his chapters. Obviously wish we'd gotten more of Adam. Every time he's there, like, please let him talk, let him do something, and then they never do. I admire, but I do not enjoy it, is how much art content there is. We know we like art, we know these characters have artistic perspectives and they think like artists, okay? We get it, we get it, I get it. I have to say that I like this more than last time. The disrespect this book trilogy has towards Gangsy and Blue is incredible. Next up, I read Red, White and Royal Blue by Casey McKinston. Well, I kind of read it, I did by Red, White, and Royal Blue Collector's Edition. History, huh? One of the most, if not the most iconic quote from this book, and then bet we could make some. Are you seeing this? It has pink and then full color here, and they're different moments, and they're so good. It actually has extra content. I know. I probably would have bought it anyways if it hadn't had it. It has a new chapter from Henry's point of view, so I had to buy it. And it wasn't just an old chapter rewritten to have a different point of view. It was a completely new chapter about what happens next, what goes on in their lives. It walks through 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023, 2025, when they get married. I spoiled it, okay? Scared to watch the movie though. <laughs> Next up, I read the second volume of Lovely Complex, one of my favorite manga collections ever. But I hadn't reread this or rewatched the anime in a while. And obviously, this is from 2001. So you can't expect our values to be the same to 2001 Japan era, okay? I understand that, but it kind of shocked me when I was reading this. I was like, wait, wait a minute, okay, okay. Suspension of disbelief. I, I know I love this and there's so many parts of this that are so good, but this right here is not it. But apart from that little moment, everything else is so good. So if you like manga, anime, if you like rom-coms, if you like laughing, if you like coming of age if you had like characters who have complexes about their appearances about their heights if you like the trope of two idiots in love and mutual pinning and yes two idiots in love and friends to lovers and bickering and everything like that and if you like fashion and music and if you like you know high school settings then this this is the manga for you 
I just finished reading Grey Warren by Maggie Steve Otter like 20 minutes ago, so these aren't my final thoughts. These are my initial thoughts after just reading it. I don't like the titles of the books, and I don't like the covers of the books. Individually, they are harmless, but put together, I feel like it has a bit of a scattered aesthetic. And for some reason, my first two books of this series are like, they have a paper feel to them, okay? They're not shiny, they feel like paper. This one feels like plastic and it's so shiny. This, in my opinion, is definitely the superior book. I don't know if it's because I read it in three days, maybe it's because it was a final book and I was like, yes, finally, it's ending. I think it has the best pacing and the best chapters. At the beginning, I have to say, I hated Hennessy. I didn't hate her, but I was beginning to rethink why I liked her before because I could not remember. But then in the end, she pulled through and I was like, okay, you're done with your monologues. That was part of your character development. And now I like you again. Jordan and Declan were kind of sidelined until the end, especially Jordan, so she didn't do much in the story, just create sweet metals, which I stand by my opinion that it should be a sweet meal since it feeds the dream, but I digress. I like that Matthew wasn't as involved in this book as in the other ones, specifically getting as many points of views, and he had a really funny dynamic with Bride. I did think he was a bit sidelined and used more of as an afterthought at the end of the novel. Ronan had a very interesting arc this book. I'm not gonna spoil it, but he was, let's say, a very passive character all throughout this book due to certain very complicated circumstances. Ronan and Adam in this book, in the beginning, like the first 60 pages, God, that was, that was painful. But then Adam was like, <laughs> psych and it was all good again and i was so happy because i love the relationship and i love their dynamic they're such good friends they're so good for each other so it's good to see them together and happy i think my final comment on this series is that this changes everything we know about ronan so my question is do you think Maggie Steve Otter had all of this planned and thought out while she was writing the raven boy series i think she did not know as much about what she was gonna do with Declan, but she definitely knew, right? I think she planted those seeds. Final question, do you think we're getting a Blue and Gangsy spinoff book and what they do in their year abroad? I think we deserve it. So the last book I read this month was Cemetery Boys. I picked this book as my last October read because it was called Cemetery Boys and it was about witches or brujos. And I was like, that's perfect because it's gonna be Halloween. What I did not know was that it took place on the days leading up to Dia de los Muertos and Dia de los Muertos was like our big deadline. So it was perfect timing, perfect book to read during those days. Basically, this book follows our protagonist, Yadrel, who is a trans boy who wants to prove that he is a brujo. So one day when he's trying to prove this, he finds the spirit of a boy called Julian, or Julian, I'm not sure how they say it because they keep calling him Jules. So basically, that he has to keep this spirit with him, they have to go on an adventure to find out what happened to his spirit, and wouldn't you know it, Yadriel and Julian fall in love throughout it. At the beginning, I was very worried because I thought it was going to be insta-love. It was just four days to fall in love before Dia de Muertos. And I was like, I do not like this time frame. But they actually built it up pretty slowly. And then you're like, okay, this could be how an actual crush develops. I, I can buy that, okay? Very good. I liked the romance. I thought at the end, once everything was resolved, that it was a bit too intense for what was a four-day fling. I wish we could have seen more from Diego. Diego was Yadriel's older brother, and him being a brujo and having been born into a male body, I think it would have been really interesting to see his relationship with Yadriel. I just have to say that that resolution at the end and the third act conflict, just it went by in the blink of an eye. I saw it coming. Three out of five stars and I would recommend it, especially this time of year. So please leave a like if you like this video. Comment down below if you've read any of the books I've read or what books you have been reading. Click that subscription button if you're not subscribed yet and click that bell button so you get notified every time I post a new video. I post videos just like this every single Friday and I guess I'll see you guys next time. Bye.